Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Hello and welcome to Genealogy Gems Podcast, episode number 108. You know, I feel like I should come up with a more creative way to kick off each episode, but most times I'm just so excited to get to your emails and the gems that I have lined up for you that I'm I'm always racing to jump into things. Um, but there has been one thing on my mind lately that we could talk about, and I'm wondering if maybe you've been thinking about this too. You know, when I got home from my last speaking engagement, I was catching up on the Who Do You Think You Are TV series, which I had recorded on the DVR. And Bill and I were watching Steve Buscemi's episode, which, by the way, I thought was really excellent. And it really had a different tone to it, didn't it? And really, they have all been excellent. I was okay with watching the story unfold, even though it was actually in the reverse of how we would do the research, wasn't it? I mean, they start with some of the oldest information, and then they work their way forward. And in family history research, of course, we typically start with the most recent event and work our way backwards. But I was totally okay with that, because it really does make for much better storytelling, and it played up the the mystery of the questions that were being answered. But when they threw his pedigree chart up there on the screen, I really did a double take. They listed the women in his tree with their first name and their married name. And I had to stop and rewind. And Bill's like, what are you doing? I just had to look again because my brain just didn't get it. And sure enough, there were no maiden names listed on his chart, only married names for the women. And I thought, well, I guess they're doing that because they think it's easier for non-genealogists to follow. But I'm not so sure that that logic holds up. It's just plain confusing to see that Mr. and Mrs. Smith, that their daughter, her last name is Jones. So I'm wondering, did you catch that? And what did you think about it? Let's say somehow listing women's names that way is easier for the viewers to follow. And and really, I don't really think I can agree with that. But do you think that the producers should have deviated to that extent? you know, when showing the pedigree charts, doing something so kind of against the grain of what we would do in genealogy. I'm beginning to wonder if this has happened on past episodes, and maybe I just didn't catch it before, because I do get a lot of email. And I've had a couple of folks who are particularly who are new to family history say that um, they list the women with their married name, but now they're not sure what to do with the maiden name now that they've found, you know, the birth certificate or whatever. And that's kind of really surprised me because that's just about one of the first things that we learn when we do our research. And certainly, of course, the woman in my previous example is not listed as Jones on her birth certificate, but rather the name that she was born with, which was Smith. So what do you think? If you have an opinion on this, email me or better yet, leave a voicemail on the voicemail line. You can call 925-272-4021 anytime. Leave a voicemail and I may just play your comments here on the show. So besides stewing about names on charts on TV shows, um, I've just gotten back from the Ohio Genealogical Society Conference where I spoke on a couple of great Google topics and hung out with Allison Stacy, the editor of Family Tree Magazine at the Family Tree Magazine booth in the exhibit hall. And I have to say, I loved meeting many of you there. I, I really did. And I, I do hope to see more listeners next weekend when I head on up to Edmonton, Canada for the Alberta Genealogical Society Conference. That's going to be April 16th and 17th of 2011. And finally, if you can't make it to a conference in person, no worries. Stay tuned because at the end of the show, I'm going to have some free webinars for you that I'm going to be doing this month and next month. It's April and May of 2011, and I'll have all the information for you. Okay, but first, it is time to hear your news, and we will do that at the mailbox. Okay, our first email here in the mailbox comes from Angela. And she writes, faithful listener of your podcast here, I have a puzzle. And I'm wondering if there's a podcast that relates to this. 
My grandmother, Margaret Catherine Wright's birth certificate, says August 14, 1914, as does the birth date listed on her government pension certificate. However, I found her parish record, and it says that she was born August 14, 1915. An additional variable added to this is that she was born in Ottawa, whereas all of her brothers were born in Montreal. And when she asked her parents why she was born in Ottawa, they didn't give her any answer. She also felt that her biological father was not her real father. And to top it off, a lady who looked exactly like her came into a store where she worked in Montreal. The lady was dressed in Royal Canadian Navy uniform, and even her co-workers thought that she was my grandmother goofing around and dressing up. Long story short, my grandmother's co-workers insisted that the lady take a picture of herself in the store's photo booth. Lo and behold, when my grandmother came back from her coffee break, she was shown the picture of what looked like herself, and she nearly fainted. All of her life, my grandmother was sure that she hadn't been told the whole truth about her birth. Were these birth date discrepancies common in those days? Well, Angela, I would have to say that I think it may have actually been a fairly common occurrence. And certainly, we see variations in dates all the time in old records. And much of that, you know, comes down to whether the record is a primary or a secondary source. Even a source such as a parish record, which we might think of as being primary, could actually have been from a transcription. And therefore, that means that human error could have been made. Um, Or for a variety of reasons, the record could have been created at a later time rather than at the approximate time of the birth, which, of course, is what we're hoping for. So what I would recommend is gather up as many sources as you can and then do your best to kind of rank them in terms of reliability. And if you want to learn more about primary and secondary sources, you might want to review some of those earlier episodes of the Family History Genealogy Made Easy podcast. Um, Just head on over to genealogygems.com and click the yellow Family History button there. It's a big square. And um, check out some of those earlier ones, because we did talk quite a bit about how to differentiate between the primary and the secondary and that type of thing. Um, But it, it sounds like that you have a lot of indicators that there is more of a story there. And of course, if there was an adoption involved, um, that might explain some of the date discrepancies. Gosh, it's too bad they didn't get that lady's name and address who looks so much like your grandmother. That is amazing. And Angela was so kind as to uh, send me the photographs comparing the two. It's just uncanny. Really, it is uncanny. So Angela, if you ever solved the mystery about your grandmother's birth and the the dates and and the mystery woman, I would love to hear the outcome. And I know everybody else listening probably wants to hear it too. So do drop me into the line. We'd love to hear more about that. And my next email here is about a gem found in the Library and Archives of Canada. Gary in Surrey, British Columbia writes, I was listening to podcast number 104, and you mentioned that Library and Archives Canada had the 1915 Western Census online. My wife has some family that moved from Ontario to Saskatchewan in the late 1800s, so I thought I'd take a quick look. Unfortunately, the census is not named indexed, so I'm going to have to wait to get the location to do a proper search. While I was there, I decided to look around some more. On the homepage, there is a general search box, so I entered Watchorn, which was my mother-in-law's family name. Not a common name, so I knew if I found anything, it it would be a short list. In the second listing in the archive section, there was an entry. Della Watchorn, family worker at the Aluminum Company of Canada, assists Royal Canadian Air Force Inspector LAC, C. Huntley, check the numbers of Harvard propeller blades ready for shipment to be machined, January 1943. And yes, there was a picture of my mother-in-law working during the war. Needless to say, my wife was amazed. She knew her mother worked there during the war, but to actually find a picture of her in the government archives was not expected. Keep coming up with these gems. You never know where they may lead. Ah, terrific story, Gary. Yay, I'm so glad that the gem uh, paid off for you. And uh, that is awesome to hear. Thank you. And Letitia in Ashford, England writes in, she says, Hi, I enjoy your podcast enormously, though I have to admit a lot of the technical stuff goes over my head. My son says I'm a technophobe and has called me Picnic. 
This is usually after I have to ask for help on what is apparently a simple problem. Picnic, by the way, stands for problem in chair, not in computer. <laughs> However, that aside, I have reached podcast number 92. Dave Obi, who was very interesting to listen to. Time obviously was limited, but I would like to just draw attention to the founding of Nova Scotia, which people may think is entirely because of loyalists living in the States. And Dave was talking about kind of the general background of Canada and the research to be done in Canada. And uh, Letitia says the Highland Clarences were a huge factor. Nova Scotia does mean New Scotland. As I said, his talk had to be, of course, telescoped to fit limited time, but this may well be of interest to those who have a Scot in their tree. Thank you again for very entertaining programs. Well, Letitia, thank you. I appreciate that uh, further history of that area. Definitely, that would be of interest to people who are looking for ancestors in that area, and of course, the Scottish connection. And I have to say, I love your son's picnic label. In fact, I loved it so much that uh, when I was out in Ohio last weekend, I used it in my presentations. <laughs> so tell him thank you. I just think that's a riot. And it's funny, the whole audience just cracked up. It was it was very funny. And let's see here. Um, Phyllis from Portland, Oregon also wrote in. She's a new blogger, and she has a question about the Android app. She says, first, I want to let you know how much I enjoy your podcast. Thank you, Phyllis. I appreciate that. She says, I really appreciate all the hard work you put into getting information to us about how to successfully trace our family roots and for encouraging us to start a blog. I started my blog last October. The site address is www.delprincipefamilytree.com. And once the word got out about the site, my family members that I never knew I had contacted me to give me information about our ancestors. I was even able to find a relative of my great grandmother and my great grandfather in Pescaroli, Italy, and have begun corresponding with them. So exciting. I recently became a premium listener and I also got your app for my Android phone. I notice when listening to your podcast on my phone that I'm unable to pause your show and return to the same spot. I have to start the podcast over. The slider bar doesn't work, so I can't try to move forward to the spot I was in. Any ideas of a workaround? Thanks again for all your hard work. Well, first of all, thank you for your kind email and and wow, that is so terrific that you have been contacted by uh, distant cousins and relatives through your blog. That is the big payoff, isn't it? Wonderful and good for you for getting out there and putting it out there. That's really the key. And regarding Phyllis's issue with the app, you know, when, when little hangups like that happen, the solution is usually that you need to go and check for an update for the app. Because the apps are getting updated and tweaked fairly often. And when they do, sometimes that means that things that worked properly before kind of get funky, <laughs> if you will. And when you do the update to the most current version, not only for the app, but if you keep the operating system of your phone current and updated, that usually solves all the issues and it goes right back into working smoothly. And in fact, I emailed Phyllis with that suggestion and she replied back and said, that did the trick. So if you have an iPhone or an Android smartphone, which I just got one, and I love it. It's pretty cool. Um, we do have the Genealogy Gems podcast apps for you. I will have links in the show notes for you. And I want to remind all of you app users out there that in addition to the episodes that are included that you can either stream or you can download, I want to remind you all that we usually do upload a few extra bonus goodies into the apps. So with the last episode, for example, I included a video version of my interview with Dick Eastman that was part of the audio show. And I often include photographs and documents and all kinds of little extras that, you know, kind of tie into whatever we're talking about on the show. And those are unique to the apps themselves. So be sure and when you select a particular episode, click on the or, you know, press the bonus or the extras button for that episode and you'll find some of those extras. And have you ever wondered about how to cite Wikipedia as a source in your family history research? Well, 
Sean wrote in with some tips. Uh, He says, I'm listening to Genealogy Gems episode number 104. And the discussion mentioned looking up information on Wikipedia. Back in October, I put up a quick post on my blog about how to best cite Wikipedia articles as a source in, in a genealogy database. As a Wikipedia administrator, there are a few tools I know about that are available to, ge- to the general public, yet they aren't always utilized to their full extent. The example I used regarding finding the date of a Civil War battle that is only referenced by name in the source I was currently reading is on my blog. And of course, in his post, Sean says that Wikipedia's page, um, for example, on the Civil War battle, the Battle of the Wilderness, which is what he was looking at, gave him the dates of the battle and the location. And he says that the key to the source citation is the website link. Sean makes a great point. You don't want to use the link that you actually find in the Wikipedia article, but rather click on the text permanent link. It says permanent link. I've always wondered what those were. (laughs) And he says, you'll find it in the left hand column of the Wikipedia page, you click on that. And Sean says that this takes you to the page for the exact version of the article that you're looking at. So that way your source won't end with a link that says, oh, this is a dead end or the link is broken. It takes you to the original permanent place where that article is held. And Sean also mentions in his article that Wikipedia has a page about citing Wikipedia articles in other research. And uh, he provides a link to that as well. Really good information. Now, of course, I know Wikipedia is not a primary source. We absolutely agree on that. (laughs) And everything you find, of course, has to be verified. But Sean does shed light in his article about the reliability of the information, which he can speak to because he's a Wikipedia administrator. In the end, Wikipedia is a really great source of information that can provide you clues and it can point you to where to look for potential primary sources. You can read Sean's article at his Finding the Flock blog, and I will have a link to that specific article in the show notes for this episode, which is number 108. Next up, Ken in Washington, D.C. has a beef with Ancestry. First, he says, thank you for the time and effort it takes in putting together your podcasts. I walk several miles to work each day, and I find the podcast a wonderful way to pass the time. I started with all of your archive podcasts when I found the series early last year, finished up those last summer, and now eagerly await each new one. Your most recent episode had me thinking about some of my frustrations with Ancestry.com. Two big ones come to mind. The first is the material, especially personal pictures and such, that people easily lift from Ancestry pages to copy to their own, often with no attribution or thanks. This ties into Dick Eastman's comments on the past episode about what to share and what not to share online. The other is my broader beef with Ancestry.com, which is the wholesale copying of family lines that are incorrect. For example... I've seen family pages where the parents have kids that were born before the parents were still trying to figure out the biology there. I've already come to the conclusion that Ancestry is a good portal into some interesting primary sources such as the census and birth records. I'm fortunate to have a lot of ancestors from Minnesota, but terrible for sharing because so many of the family trees there are just wrong. Regards from a fan in Washington, D.C. Well, Ken, I feel your pain. I really do. And I'm guessing that there are a lot of family historians out there listening right now who have felt your pain too. (laughs) So far, you know, Ancestry is pretty silent on this issue. And there may be a couple of different reasons for that. My personal guess is that in the end, it's a business issue for them. And they are very heavily focused, at least right now, on gaining new users rather than retaining existing users. In fact, I heard several people talking about this in the last couple of conferences that I've been to. It's really a business strategy, even though I don't personally agree with that or adhere to that strategy um, in terms of just focusing on the new ones and not the existing customers. And I would really welcome the opportunity to do an interview with someone in Ancestry's management if they'd be willing to sit down and talk candidly about this. Because my feeling is that if they just came out and admitted that they have other priorities, or that it is a business strategy to focus on new users, 
then I think genealogists could just accept that that is the way it is. And that in the end, you know, we need to take primary responsibility for our data and not trust it in the hands of someone or a company that is not as invested in it as we are. I mean, I'm speaking pretty plainly here, and I'm really not saying that Ancestry should do anything differently. I mean, it would be wonderful in a perfect world if they did, but they have their own priorities and their own, you know, things they need to accomplish. I'm just saying that the reality is they don't fight as fiercely for accuracy as we do. And that will probably just be much happier if we see online family trees as a tool that we need to monitor and manage, you know, what goes into it, what we keep out of them. (laughs) And most importantly, that we look at other people's trees as only a clue, not a source, not even accurate, just kind of some breadcrumbs on the ground that we might want to follow to see where they lead and see if they can be substantiated. So that's my ever to be humble opinion on the matter of uh, ancestry family trees. I think great things can happen from them. But I also think we have to really tread with caution. And again, I'm always interested to hear what the rest of you out there have to say about this and what you're thinking about it and what your experience has been in working with um, the ancestry family trees. It's been a hot topic for quite a while. But you bring up some great points, Ken, and I think it's really a worthwhile discussion. So thank you very much for taking the time to write in and to tell us about your experience and what some of your concerns are, because I think many of us do share them. Next up, Tammy in Oklahoma. She writes, I'm a longtime listener and happy to say that I am now a premium member as well. Well, welcome, Tammy. That's wonderful. She says, my parents enjoy the family research that I do and are the first ones I call when I make a new discovery. While they're not researching themselves, they wanted to make a contribution to the family project, so they purchased a premium membership from me for Christmas. Can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. Oh, that's wonderful to hear. Thank you, Tammy. Um, She says, I was recently transcribing letters that my grandmother sent home while she was serving as a WAC, a W-A-C, in London and Paris during World War II. It amazes me how lucky I am every time I sit down to work on them. I literally have two three-ring binders packed with letters and mementos that her family saved. Her name was Louise Liberty Osborne. Yes, that honestly was her middle name and was born to a Scandinavian immigrant. Oh, it's a great name. She was quite a character. One of the last letters I was working on mentioned that she appeared on the national broadcast of the U.S. Army Hour, which was on Sundays from 12 to 1.30, according to her letter. The letter stated May 14th, 1944. Do you know if recordings of these broadcasts still exist? What a find that would be. Appreciate any help or direction that you can give me. Well, Tammy, I do have a couple of ideas for you and maybe actually a couple of items for you regarding that broadcast. Um, There is a website that specializes in old radio logs, you know, the logs, the the schedules of the radio shows. And it's jjonz.us slash radio logs. And I would highly recommend, even though they don't have the audio there posted on the website, they are, it appears that they're very much experts on the topic. So I would recommend emailing them directly through their website to see if they have any leads on where old recordings might be held. And sometimes these sites like this are, are actually collectors who may have their own personal collections. So you never know, you might get lucky. Um, I also did a search of the Library of Congress sound recordings, but I didn't find anything in there. Uh, But they are constantly adding to their collection, so I would definitely check back there periodically, and I'll have a link for you directly in the show notes. I would also recommend um, setting up some Google alerts. You might want to do Army Hour in quotation marks plus 1944, for example. And of course, don't forget eBay favorite searches, um, because there are lots of old time radio collectors out there, people who put together compilation CDs, and they do sell them on eBay. And you want to make sure that your eBay favorite search looks for your keywords, not only in the title, but that you also mark it to check the description, because oftentimes what they'll do is they'll list the different episodes in the description of the auction itself. 
There are also um, several old-time radio podcasts in iTunes, which are very popular. I did a quick search, and I didn't see the Army Hour, but I would recommend clicking through to each podcast website um, for the old-time radio and maybe, again, even contacting the podcaster to inquire further. Maybe they have more leads or something in their own personal collection. These guys tend to really be experts on the old recordings, and I'm sure they'd be thrilled to help you. And uh, finally, I did find an article about that specific broadcast actually in Ancestry, which I sent you via email. And there's the entire page there, and as well as the close up of the clipping. And this article I found by doing a keyword search in Ancestry. You know, when we go into the search fields for Ancestry, we tend to think we've got to put a name in there. And of course, your ancestor wasn't um, specified by name in the article. So I went down to keyword and I just did a keyword search and I think I put like 1944 and anyway, it popped right up and it was a really neat article that talks about the broadcast and the fact that it was a very special broadcast and that it was in celebration of the WAX anniversary. So if I can, for the rest of you listening, I'm going to try and post that on the website so that you can click through and take a look at this article that I found. Um, But it's real fun. And I think it was um, the day after the letter that your grandmother wrote. You said it was May 14th of 1944. The article's from May 15th of 1944, talking about that particular broadcast. So I hope you enjoy that. It was kind of fun to do a little search. And let's see here. Oh, gosh, next up, Susan writes in. She says, I love listening to your podcast. You have so many great ideas for family history research. I learn something new with every broadcast. I was wondering if you or any of your listeners have had any luck in finding family records at a church in Germany. Who would I contact to see if there is a record? My family's from Osnabrück, Germany, and there are two Lutheran churches that may have my family listed in their records. Any suggestions would be great. Well, Susan, I'm very happy to say that I've had a great deal of luck finding German church records. And the best way, I think, to start is to go to FamilySearch.org, look up Osnabrück in the Family History Center library catalog online. You want to look under the location and and just type Osnabrück in the location field. You'll find a large number of record collections there. Click on church records, and then follow the links to the records that you need um, there. There's lots of great resources there. I just checked that out. And you can then order the microfilm from your local family history center. Or if uh, the records have been digitized and they're online, um, that should be indicated there on the page and you can just click right through. If you are new to using Family History Centers and uh, the online catalog, I've done several podcast episodes about that in the Family History podcast series. So um, you might want to check that out as well. That's available over at the website, genealogygems.com. And the Family Search Wiki is also a tremendous online free resource to learn more about doing German research. And it can answer a lot of questions that kind of pop up along the way. So you might uh, just go to Google, type in Family Search Wiki, or you'll find it there. I think you can get to it from FamilySearch.org. But really, I think that's the best place to start. And that way you can send those microfilms to your local center, sit down and really go through them on the microfilm reader, and hopefully have some great success finding your ancestors there. Gosh, it feels good to make time for all of uh, your terrific comments and questions. I know that all of you are very busy, and I appreciate all of you who took the time to write in. Great stuff. Are you looking to take the next step in your family history research and start recording your family tree in your own genealogy database? Or are you looking to make a switch to a more user-friendly genealogy software program? When my listeners and students ask me which program I prefer, I always recommend Roots Magic. It's the program I decided to make the switch to a couple of years ago, and I am so glad I did. You just won't find a more powerful genealogy software program, and building your family tree is easier than ever with the new Roots Magic 4. With Roots Magic, you can add unlimited facts, find anyone in your database with lightning speed with Roots Magic Explorer. Quickly and easily create perfectly formatted sources with the Roots Magic Source Wizard. It makes it so easy. 
You can create customized reports. And best of all, you can now take Roots Magic wherever your research takes you with Roots Magic to go, which lets you run Roots Magic directly off your flash drive. And Roots Magic makes it a snap to share your family history. You know how important I think that is. It'll help you publish a book, create stunning wall charts, shareable CDs, even create websites automatically from your data. Really, what are you waiting for? Download your risk-free trial of Roots Magic 4 and see why professionals and beginners alike choose Roots Magic at rootsmagic.com. No matter how long you have been doing your family history research, chances are you have a census challenge. For me, it's the Sporowski family trying to find them where I know they should be in 1920. We all deal with this. And so when I was at the recent Family History Expo in Mesa, Arizona, I noticed that Jason Harrison of Family Search was giving a presentation on tips and tricks for getting through some of those brick walls with your census research. Jason is a U.S. and Canada research consultant for the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, and he's a certified genealogist. His specialties include New England, Midwestern, Mountain States, and LDS research. He's been involved in genealogy both personally and professionally for over a decade, and he was the recipient of the 2006 Mansfield Scholarship Award in Family History. Here's my conversation with Jason Harrison. Well, hi, Jason. Thanks so much for joining me here on the podcast. Oh, thank you for having me. Now, I know that um, I've seen you over at the Family Search booth, and you've had lots of people coming through there. Tell us a little bit, because you've got a lot of folks working in the booth, and, and you look like you have, um, is there interactive displays, or what is it folks are doing over there at the Family Search booth? Surprisingly enough, uh, people are coming to learn about Family Search. Uh, we're still getting uh, people that have never heard anything about Family Search and aren't aware of the free resources that are offered online. So, uh, pretty much what we're doing is uh, kind of introducing them to Family Search, to the website, uh, helping them get registered. There are some who have had. Uh, uh, a lot of experience uh, working with uh, various family search products that have questions, so trying to provide some support uh, as well as uh, maybe temper uh, some tempers as well. They've let us know a few things that uh, they don't like, and so you know, trying to, to remain positive as well. <laughs> so, and that's probably because there have been so many changes and transitions. I think it's, it seems like it's all moving the right direction in terms of you know what you're making available, but it's hard to change and to kind of get used to. Okay, now we're going to do it a little differently. Is that some of what you're struggling with with folks? Yeah, people are having a hard time with the new skin to family search and kind of the user experience. Uh, they're so accustomed to the way they did things in the past and, and finding some things uh, are a little bit different uh, and knowing where to find things is, has been tough uh, on some. So, yeah, there, there's a learning curve uh, that people are going through right now. So trying to just help them navigate uh, and uh, increase their user experience. Do you guys walk away and, and actually end up incorporating some of those ideas? Is it still in any kind of development, or is it kind of this is the outer shell that it's going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, we're just barely beginning to tap what Family Search can be. Um, and if users would uh, take advantage of the feedback feature that's on every page when they have problems, uh, when they have suggestions or ideas that could improve the user experience, they monitor the feedback uh, uh, really well, and they're in, encouraged by some of the responses. Unfortunately, what happens is people come in and they say, "Well, I don't like this, or I don't like that, or, or I just you've you've destroyed Family Search." And you know, they don't provide anything that we can take back and uh, and use to to try to make the user experience better. So, uh, I, I think we're just barely starting to tap some of what Family Search can be. I think uh, we'll continue to see some changes, and it's only going to get better. Yeah, that's great. And that's something we have to just keep in mind. Is if, if we want it to grow, we kind of have to help you guys along with the feedback side so that you know how, you know, what's working and what's not. I know here I've looked at the schedule and, and you've been kind of busy in addition to your booth. You've been teaching some classes. And one of the ones that kind of stood out to me on the program was your U.S. Census Techniques and Strategies for Finding Elusive Ancestors. And it stood out to me because... Yes, we all use the census, but um, 
I'm a, I'm a firm believer that we can go further, and sometimes, you know, we take it at face value and we don't realize there's more that can be done. So jump in and give us an overview. When you talk about techniques and strategies, um, what might we be thinking about with the U.S. Census that we aren't doing right now? You know, people are, are so quick to assume after doing just a few searches in an online census database and coming up with uh, negative results that their ancestor was missed. Um, they start forming all these uh, hypotheses, you know, they were in the witness protection program or, you know, whatever it is uh, that to try to explain why they can't find their ancestor. So trying to provide them with some additional tips uh, and suggestions of ways that they could approach the problem, not to give up, to stay uh, persistent. Uh, I found that I found more individuals in the census that were really there when uh, I just uh, kind of pushed ahead and tried new uh, things. So uh, the class has been designed to kind of highlight various uh, techniques and strategies that I've found most helpful when uh, working with patrons of the Family History Library. Some of those that I think uh, are most applicable that uh, people usually don't think about is they focus just on their ancestor only and they don't think about maybe searching for siblings or uh, parents or, uh, you know, children or spouses. Uh, focusing just on one name uh, sometimes limits what they're able to find. So you find the original family you were looking for and the temptation is then to want to jump ten years back and continue following that family, but there you are in the middle of that that uh, era and that neighborhood, if you will, and you're saying, we should probably just stop and go ahead and get some of those collateral, the cluster around that family, because they may come in real handy decades further back, right? Yeah, you bet. Uh, so what happens is we don't uh, analyze the census well enough, and, and we don't uh, use that information to our advantage when we go searching, uh, whether it be forward or backwards, uh, in the census. Uh, and if we do, we typically will just focus on the family and we don't think about those who were uh, living next to our neighbors as well. Another excellent strategy that we talk about is focusing on other members in the community, uh, the neighbors. Um, maybe if there's something on the record that uh, you hadn't anticipated and if you searched for the neighbors you could find them because most families uh, stayed around next to one another and you may find them uh, living next to the same neighbors and so searching for that neighbor ends up being the key to unlocking that. You've got uh, different groups that uh, may have up and left the community whether it be uh, you know running off for land or maybe they're following a minister who's left and uh, congregations or communities uh, would often uh, go together and so it's a great strategy for finding people but we don't pay attention uh, as we should to those neighbors and other people living around uh, our, our ancestors. That's a great point because particularly with with certain surnames either the name gets just kind of jumbled up uh, slightly spelled different or I have seen some that have really been completely off the mark and that is so frustrating and you think well like you say maybe they just aren't there they just got missed but wow to look at the the people who are next to them and see well where were they in that decade and sure enough you may find them and I've thought about that quite a bit with the cluster of the family but not as much with the neighbors but I could really see that as being a standout strategy to use um, to hopefully find somebody. I have one, you know, you got them in the 1930 to the 1920, and it's just unbelievable that I haven't, you know, and I've tried every different type of forward backward search, yeah. but go back and maybe check the neighbors. Okay. Yeah. What other types of things do you look for in the census as a standout? Uh, let's see. Uh, when I do my searching, I limit uh, my search to just a, a few sp specific parameters. Uh, I like to search for just a name and, and by location and then uh, add more information to, to refine the, the list of results. What happens is I see a lot of people go in and they see all these fields that they can put in the boxes and they fill them all in. And so they limit finding uh, their ancestor or whoever they're looking for because they put too much information. So I always suggest that you start off based and then kind of refine as you go. Uh, great techniques uh, are to just uh, re limit yourselves to the surname and a location. Uh, if you don't have a common surname, then you uh, may not be dealing with a huge list of people to look through. And sometimes it's the, the given name. Uh, there was something you hadn't anticipated. Maybe they were listed by their initials, or maybe they were going by their middle name, uh, or they were going by a nickname. Um, and so you, you search based on what you knew them as, or the records that you have uh, refer to them as, and so you've limited yourself. So 
if you'll just uh, focus on like a surname and a location, you can typically pick up people that you wouldn't pick up otherwise. The same is true for the surname. Sometimes it's the surname that causes you problems. Uh, most enumerators were probably familiar with the common given name, so wouldn't have had any problem to write them down uh, and record them. And, and indexers will recognize them as well. But then you try to decipher that surname, and uh, they, it just gets butchered yeah. in the process. So limiting yourselves to a given name and a location can be a great strategy. And then add in additional information to kind of refine that list of results. Uh, those have been some huge uh, uh, techniques that have kind of broken through some difficult problems as well. It really is that search is an art form, isn't it? We No one strategy is going to work consistently every time. And um, really good advice, it's the same kind of thing we talk about in Google searches, which is go broad and then go narrow, you know, but sometimes you have to fluctuate back and forth. And as you say, you can really ace yourself out of results. That's a really great point. Well, all of really good tips for the census. Tell us real quick, what were some of the other classes you were teaching? This weekend, uh, we focused uh, classes on not only the census, but we taught immigration. Uh, I had an opportunity to teach a class on newspaper research, as well as uh, a kind of a vital records overview. I imagine with all the patrons that you speak to on a daily basis and all the problems you see, you really home in on where the problems lie. Do you find there are just consistent challenges that people run up against when they're dealing with these records? Yeah, it's uh, the patron experience uh, that's really helped me kind of hone in on uh, these techniques that uh, help to find people in the census. Uh, just based on their challenges, uh, it, it's kind of a fun field to be in and, and a job to have where you're having that interaction and, and you're trying to help people get past uh, the wall that uh, is there. And so determining the way to, a, a new way to approach the situation makes it fun. And then uh, passing that on is just a great thing to be able to do to, to pass that knowledge on to others so that they can take advantage of it. Well, fantastic. Jason, I appreciate you taking some time out during a busy conference to pass a lot of that information on to us. Thank you. Oh, you're sure welcome. Thank you. Profile America, Tuesday, April 12th. On this date, 150 years ago, the bloodiest chapter in American history began when Confederate troops under the command of General P.T. Beauregard fired on Fort Sumter in the harbor at Charleston, South Carolina. The shelling began four years of civil war, pitting troops of the 11 Confederate states against those of the Union Army. An estimated three million men served on both sides. By the time fighting largely ended in April 1865, an estimated 620,000 soldiers had died in battle or of other causes. By comparison, in World War II, when the U.S. had 16 million in uniform, 400,000 died in combat or of other causes. You can find these and more facts about America from the U.S. Census Bureau online at census.gov. Well, as I promised, I have some free webinars to tell you about. I got an email recently from Lyle, and he says, I just want to say I absolutely love your podcast. I recently just found it, and I am so glad I did because I'm learning so much. I'm a genealogist novice, and it's just full of information that makes everything so much easier and more fruitful. Oh, that's great to hear. He says, I would love to attend a webinar, but I'm not sure how much it costs. I don't have a lot of money, but I think it would be time well spent. Well, I hope you and your daughter are well. Keep up the good work. And if you ever come to Roanoke, Virginia, I'd love to see your work. Well, Lyle, I am so glad that you are enjoying the show. And I do have good news for you and everybody else listening. I actually have several free webinars coming up here real soon. First off, April 20th we are going to be doing getting the scoop on your ancestors from old newspapers. The folks over at the Southern California Genealogical Society Jamboree asked me to put this on, and I'm very excited to bring it to all of you out there and free of charge. They are sponsoring this. Again, it's going to be April 20th of 2011. Starts at 6 p.m. Pacific, and of course, that's 9 p.m. Eastern. That's the toughest part, I think, about webinars, keeping the time zone straight. I will have a link for you in the show notes where you can register for free for that webinar. I'm going to talk about all the different places and strategies that you can use. Um, some of my favorite tips for finding ancestors in newspapers. And of course, you can always go to just go to google.com and do a search on 
Jamboree Extension Series. Uh, They're doing a series of webinars, and that is going to be one of them. And just recently announced, in fact, I think it came out today in the Roots Magic newsletter, I'm going to be doing Ultimate Google Search Strategies for rootsmagic.com, of course, our wonderful sponsor here at the show. It's going to be on April 28th, and it's 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. This is the first time we've done this in a webinar. This is one of my most popular presentations that I do live at conferences. So if you don't get a chance to get to conferences, uh, this is your chance to sit in on this class. And we are just going to run through a ton of great tips and strategies for getting the most out of Google and hopefully getting some really good quality search results, not just thousands and thousands of websites that you don't know what to do with. That's no good. So we're going to cover that on April 28th. You can head over to rootsmagic.com and you can sign up there for free. I'm going to also have a link directly for this in the show notes and it will come out in the newsletter. So lots of easy ways. There is limited seating, but they have a lot of seats. So definitely you'll want to register early to attend that. And we are also going to do for Roots Magic webinars, Introduction to Google Earth for Genealogy. That is coming up May 24th of 2011. Again, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. And I'm just really happy, again, that... Bruce, Busby, and all the folks over at Roots Magic have been so supportive of what we're doing here in terms of Google Earth for Genealogy and bringing both of these webinars um, to everyone for free. I'm just really excited about. So we do have a couple webinars for you. And right now, you're going to be able just to uh, keep your wallet in your pocket (laughs) and come on over and join in on the fun. And we're going to do some giveaways, too. So there may be a chance for you to win a copy of my book or one of the DVDs as well, maybe even a premium membership. We're still figuring out what the prizes are going to be. But we will definitely be doing some fun giveaways during those webinars. All right. Well, we've covered a lot on this episode. I am so glad that you joined me. Thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.